Hello again, Lavington Vineyard Church, and anyone else who may be watching for whatever reason, welcome. My name is Jeremy, and I'm one of the pastors here of LVC. I wonder what you think about when you hear the word authority. What comes to your mind when you hear that word authority? Is your experience of authority mostly good or bad? Is your experience mostly healthy or unhealthy? Perhaps for you, authority is a bad concept because of how you've seen it practiced. Maybe in the home, a home where you grew up. Or perhaps in the world, just with world leaders. Leaders who you've watched in your life, maybe in your workplace. So for a lot of people, authority brings up so many bad connotations. For others, authority may have helped you flourish in your life. And so authority can have good connotations for you, healthy. Well, when we come to the question of authority, and we think about the experience that we've had when it comes to authority, for anyone and everyone, ultimately the question is, what do we do with the authority of Jesus Christ? And what implications does that have for our lives? So, when we come to where we are now, just you and me. So for you, my audience, those listening patiently, and for my own life, do we understand what the authority of Jesus means? That's the biggest question that we come to today. And what are the implications if I reject that, that authority of Jesus? What are the consequences for that rejection? So what I want us to see is how when we reject that authority of Jesus Christ, we reject what will bring us peace. He knows what we need. He knows what's best for us. Well, we also see that there are consequences to rejecting his authority. Now, for most of us listening, I think, there's also this subtle danger that even with the best of intentions... There is this perhaps subtle rejection of his authority by the way we live our lives Monday through Saturday. Well, the, the biggest tragedy of this rejection, I think, this rejection of the authority of Jesus, is that ultimately what we're doing is we are rejecting a king who weeps. We're rejecting a weeping king who knows how to bring us peace, who wants peace for our lives. Well, there's a way to avoid this tragedy. And that is by getting to the point where we sit on the edge of our seats. We sit on the edge of our seats. And what we're going to see in this story in the Gospel of Luke, there are these scenes in the life of Jesus where we see these people hanging on his words. And it's like they're on the edge of their seats. And so what I want us to do now is we're going to just dive into this new series. And so, LVC, if you've been with us for a number of months now, you know that for the last couple years, actually, at different points, we've been in this series in the Gospel of Luke. We've taken some breaks, gone to some other books and topics, but we're now coming back to the third part of the Gospel of Luke. And it's actually this well-defined part, if you will, where now Jesus comes into Jerusalem. The king comes into his city and we're entering in these last number of chapters with one final week before his death and resurrection. Now, before this, we were in the second part of Luke, where for a good 10 chapters, we were on this journey where Jesus is journeying with his disciples down to Jerusalem. And along the way, he is forming them as his disciples, these learners, literally learners of him. He is forming them as his followers who will carry on his mission eventually. So, he's journeying to Jerusalem with them. They're now in Jerusalem. And what we come to now is when the very start of this section, over these next two sermons actually, myself this week and Lily, Lord willing, next week, is when Jesus comes into the temple and the showdown will be in the temple. So that's what I want to frame before you as we get into this new series and into this text this morning. So with that little bit of, of background, and framing, let's get into the text of Scripture. So hear the word of the Lord from Luke chapter 19, 
excuse me, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. All right, now let's stop right there. We're going to park the car here for a second. And now we're going to go on and read the text, and then we're going to talk through some different things that we see and what it means and what it means for our lives. But for right now, I just want to park the car for a second and remind you that when they made that journey, on the final leg of that journey, as they approached Jerusalem, the people welcomed Jesus as the king. They celebrated that he was the king coming into the city. Well, now he comes right near the city and he weeps over it. And why I want us to stop here for a second is because I want you to just think, stop and imagine, and maybe even later in the day after you watch this or sometime in the following week, could you take like three minutes and just sit there and imagine what this looked like? And we may want to see the, someone produce a video and show this scene. But I think our imaginations are more powerful. Imagine what it was like for the creator of the universe, who we understand from Scripture was there at creation, and now in the Son of God in the flesh, he comes upon the city and he weeps over it. Well, let's keep going. He wept over it saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Chapter 20. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us, by what authority do you do these things? Or who it is that gave you this authority? He answered them, I will also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man... All the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one they also wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they shouted, or they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. That's the word of the Lord. So what I want us to see first from this text 
is that Jesus' character brings authority. So we saw that where we parked the car, where this king, what king would come into a city of people he knew would reject him eventually, and yet he weeps over it. We also see that he comes proclaiming good news to the people. He would go on into that temple and he's teaching there. He's teaching about the kingdom and he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And he's doing this to people, many of whom he knows will reject him later. And yet he brings good news. Well, then he also brings justice. When he comes into this temple, he comes into a system that is unjust. He says it's become a den of robbers. It should be, quoting the Psalms, he says it should be a house of prayer. But they've turned it into a den of robbers. And so he goes in and he drives out all of the sellers. You see, because it was supposed to be a house of prayer, but they had turned it into a marketplace. And they were keeping the Gentiles from their place of prayer. This was unjust. And this king was not having it. So we see the character of this king right off the bat. Well, you may say, look, I I accept and I love the character of Jesus. But when it comes to this judgment that we see in this text, you say, what do I do with that? See, we modern people, we don't like this aspect of judgment. We love Jesus' character and his goodness. But when it comes to his judgment, we say, is that part of his goodness? But indeed it is. This text shows us that Jesus' judgment shows his authority. So there in chapter 19, verses 42 to 44, right at the beginning, what we see is that rejection will have consequences. So this king comes weeping. This weeping king comes in and he is grieved because he sees how he knows what will bring them peace, but they will reject that. So there in verse 44, that hour of visitation, the visitation is from him. He, the king who will come to visit them, they will reject him. And that rejection will have consequences. Well, then we see down there in in chapter 20, verses 9 to 16, he tells this parable about this vineyard with its owner and servants and tenants. And you notice he tells this to the people. Now, the religious leaders, they perceive that he's telling this about them. But we see there in verse 16 that he says he will destroy those tenants. They have not only rejected, but they have killed the servants who stand for the prophets of Israel. And now when the beloved son comes, they also kill him. Well, it says the owner of the vineyard will come and he will destroy those tenants and he will give the vineyard to someone else. He will come and judge them. Well, right after that, Jesus says to them, it says, in fact, to everyone listening, that everyone and anyone are liable. And what he means here is when he says that the, the stone that the builders have rejected is this cornerstone, the most important stone in the foundation of a building that holds it all together, he's saying about himself, this is me. And he's saying not only to the religious leaders from that parable, but to anyone listening, that if anyone rejects that cornerstone, the strength of that foundation, they will be liable. In fact, that cornerstone will crush them. Strong words from the weeping king. So listen, I wonder what is the authority in your life? Is the authority Jesus Christ? Is the authority your creator, God? Or is the authority yourself? Do you have a heart that does not want to be ruled? Is your heart that kind of heart that says, no, thank you, I am the king. I want to decide for myself about my life. Well, maybe you say, though, okay, I'm, I'm convinced that Jesus has the right to rule. He gets to decide about my life. But maybe you're saying, well, but, but what about my life? In, in, the, in the practical reality, what does it mean for me to submit to his authority and live under his good rule? 
Well, that's here where we see that Jesus' words have authority. So back earlier in our text, we see in chapter 19, verse 48, that the religious leaders, they're wanting to destroy Jesus. Now, they've already been upset with him earlier in Luke's gospel. They've sent people up to Galilee to see him as he's doing all these miracles and he's casting out demons and he's teaching and he's bringing authority by all these things. And they come and they test him, they challenge him. But now he's on their home turf. Now, what's interesting is, of course, we know, if we know the story of Scripture, that this temple, this is actually his turf. But they think that he's on their turf. And in a sense, he is. He is new. He's just come into Jerusalem. And there's this confrontation. And they're so upset already that they want to destroy him by what he comes in the temple to do. But they're unable to do it. They're unable to do anything. Why? Because the people are hanging on his words. Now, LVC, as I just marinated in this text this week, I saw afresh, perhaps for the first time, I just honed in on this phrase, hanging on his words. And with further study, I came to find out that Luke, our inspired author, he uses this word that was translated hanging on his words. And it's the only time in the entire Bible that this word is used hanging on his words. He could have written the equivalent of they were very attentive or they paid very good attention to his words. But no, Luke is like he's saying they are on the edge of their seat. They are hanging on his words. So Jesus, this weeping king, he comes in to the temple at the start of this series. And what do we see? We see that he has authority from his character authority from his judgment, and authority from his words. And so in light of all this, we see that the tragedy of rejecting him is it's rejecting someone who's come to bring us peace. The one who holds judgment in his hands and says, yet I come to bring you peace. I'm weeping over the fact that you will not accept the peace that I have for you. And so in light of that tragedy, the question for us today is, What would it look like for you? What would it look like for me to hang on his words? And so to start, why don't you check out this testimony from Jumane? So LVC, this is the second sermon in a row where I want to share with you a testimony of someone in our church and how what's been going on in their life applies to the text of scripture that we're looking at. So this week, it's my fellow elder Jumane Tafawa. And I'm excited to welcome him. So, Jumani, welcome to the sermon recording. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, good to be with you. I love the, the sunny skies that you're under right now, man. The nice blue sunny skies. <laughs> so, Jumani, one of the things we're talking about from today's passage in Luke is submitting to the authority of Jesus by hanging on his words. And so, I understand that you know, for a number of years in your life, you've had this deepening intimacy with the Lord, this communion with him. But then also during this pandemic, not only that growing intimacy with him, but specifically a Bible study tool that's helped you hang on his words more. So tell us about that. Um, Yeah, happy to. Um, You know, it's it's interesting um, that we hear the common thread all the time um, from this pandemic in terms of the the hardship of being physically separated from each other, the, the, the hardships for how it's impacted our work, it's impacted our lifestyle, um, um, and really yeah, every aspect of, 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 our, of, um, of how we operate. Um, and it's been interesting for me that during this time, uh, I guess I've had an opportunity to, to, con- to consistently ensure that I'm spending time with God and, and, and in the Word. And and um, and actually, this this actually goes back to um, a, a a sermon that I that I done, I did at LVC at the beginning of I think 2019, if I remember correctly, where I had identified that hey, there's there's all this there's a whole area of the Bible that I understand well, but there's a whole area which I have no clue about, and one of that areas I said was you know this, this whole idea of the spiritual and how that how that manifests itself, 
And so during uh, this period of the pandemic, I've had a chance to deepen in two areas. One in terms of deepening in, in the word, and another in terms of deepening in terms of understanding what, it, what the, the overlap between, I can describe as heaven and earth or the spiritual and, and, and the worldly um, mm. and, and really deep into prophecy. And so those two have just been two areas that I've seen God um, or that I've, I've experienced God in such amazing ways. Mm. So, so regarding the first one, on, um, uh, maybe I'll mention prophecy first, is um, I've had such a, um, an amazing time hungering and thirsting um, to understand what exactly are these gifts and how do they work and, and what do they do? And I've had an amazing time where even in this even during the pandemic, um, I've been able to you know have conversations with people. We're just chatting, and then the Holy Spirit is able to share something with me. I share it with that person, and it's it's just it's exactly what they needed to hear. So I really appreciate the idea of just hunger and thirsting for God, and He manifests that by um, using me as a messenger for His people. Uh, mm-hmm. That that has just been uh, been amazing, and I realize especially during this pandemic when we're so disconnected. And when we find it hard too to create that silo, whether it's in our own house because there's lots of noise and kids and etc., um, I've been able to 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 know with confidence that, that God is speaking, that God is speaking to each and every one of us, and He just loves us intimately. Um, you know, I was just talking to someone from LVC yesterday, and and they were saying that someone randomly said, "Hey, by the way, there's a family I want you to go out and talk to," and the family is is they just lost their their mom to um, to COVID. And so just go out there and talk to them. And this person went out there and, and they started chatting. And all of a sudden, they just started prophesying to these four young girls. And then, then she and each of them said exactly what you just shared with me was um, connected to what their mother had shared with them and what and the plans that God has for them. And it just uplifted their spirits. And they were confident that, yes, while they lost their mother, um, that God is with them. And I just love that message that, the, the, that I keep on hearing um, through the prophetic words that I've seen or that I've also uh, been a part of. Mm-hmm. So that's on the, on the prophetic side. On, the, on, on God's word, um, I, you know, <laughs> um, I describe being an elder as um, the more, the more I, I, I learn, the more I realize I have much more to learn. Amen. And as I've been studying the word, it's the same thing. The more I learn, the more I realize how little I know. And um, during this period, I, I, I love that there are a number of different master level programs that are available uh, across the world um, on how to read the Bible. And so I've started to dive into, into at least one of those or a couple of those materials. And it's just been amazing. I mean, it covers everything from how its Bible is written um, and I think most, what has been, one mo- uh, of the threads that have been important for me has just been understanding the difference between how I see the world. So when I read the Bible, I read it from my eyes, mm. but then the Bible is a book that has been written over generations and has spoken to every generation. Yeah. And as I spend time almost backtracking saying, well, how would the Bible have appeared to people in different generations going all the way back to. Um, you know, the Egyptians and the Syrians and, and the, the people around the Persians are, are around when the, 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 um, the Old Testament was written, then it really does provide so much more illumination into understanding um, uh, such fundamental concepts. Like, for example, I, I, when I read the Bible, I read it in terms of this, these are facts and these are things that have happened, but I'm realizing that there is actually, the Bible emphasizes more meaning than it does um, the context of how I read and, and understand facts. So, for example, uh, what is it? Um, Matthew, when he when he writes about the genealogy for Jesus, he he deliberately chose to 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 use the sequence of I'm only going to pick a few people from Jesus from the genealogy, and I'm going to put them in groups of seven. And he did that on purpose. Like he he knew that if you were to go into the into the scrolls and read, you would find more information. But he did that on purpose because he wanted to emphasize seven four, um, times two, three times to emphasize that Jesus is the completeness going back to um, David, going back to um, Abraham and, and, um, and, and, and Noah. And so there's meaning. And so what I've appreciated is when I read a genealogy now, it's not just, oh, it's a boring list of a whole bunch of names, but <laughs> actually, no, there's, a, there's meaning behind there. And if I take the time 
important to understand and study it, it would it would provide so much more. Another quick one on genealogy, since I know that's probably something boring people find, um, is the table of nations. So with Noah, you know, just reading this list and being like, okay, it's great. There are a whole bunch of people that came that were descendants. But then um, uh, one of the the the, the piece of master level courses I was doing illuminated to the idea that actually almost every person you're going to come across in the Bible is actually related and they come back to this table of nations. And so now brings me, so then it made me think, well, in that case, that means everybody who's fighting in the Bible are actually brothers, they're family. And so it now brings me now in terms of application is like, when I see someone who is of a different religion, I shouldn't see them as, ah, oh, they must believe something else. I actually see them as, no, that's my brother. I need to reach out to that person. I need every single person I meet, I need to treat as my brother because we are one family. Mm. Um, whether as believers or not, we are created under him and we are all part of his humanity and we all are supposed to um, uh, be an image of God. Mm. And so I think that just the application has been amazing for me in terms of making me realize that I view the world from my eyes. And every time I do that, I could potentially misconstrue how God sees the world. Yeah. And it goes back to our vision for LVC, you know, seeing the world through God's eyes. Yeah. The more we spend time with him, the more we're able to change the way we see the world and see it from his eyes. And the, the notions of, of love become more than just a word, but they become action. How do I demonstrate that love that God has for me, um, for others? And what sacrifices am I willing to make um, just as God sacrificed for us? Mm. Um, so I think those, those have been amazing. Whether the word has been amazing for me and my own understanding, prophecy has been amazing for um, just, just building up the body of Christ. Mm. And, and for me, it just emphasizes the, the notion of a disciple. That it, I believe, strongly believe, that as a disciple, we should all aim to ensure that at least every three months, that the way we see the world is being transformed because of how much time we spend with him and how he transforms the logs in our eye, how he transforms um, how we see others and the love he has for us and how we're supposed to express that. So that, that's my new, um, I'm gonna put it out there as a calling for everybody to say three months, we should all be aiming that every three months we are transformed in terms of how we see the world. Because that's mm -hmm. a lifelong learner of a disciple that you are constantly learning. And so I don't believe in, you can have incremental learning, but let's go for leaps and bounds. Let's just aim Amen. for leaps and bounds instead of learning by spending time with him. So. Amen. And that transformation is part of our mission statement, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, well, Jumane, yes. thank you so much for taking this bit of time to share what God's been doing in your life. And in terms of the specific Bible study tool, LVC in the show notes of this video, and we'll put it up on other resources for you to see if you want to join in, but please do always let us know how we can help you grow. Cause indeed God has so much more for us in terms of that transformation because he loves us. So Jumane, thank you, brother. Have a great hey, week. Thanks again. All, All right. right. Take care, everyone. Take care, man. Bye. Bye. So again, my friend, brother, sister in Christ, someone who's just happened across this video, what has authority in your life? What do you give authority to in your life? Do you have a heart that does not want to be ruled? And is that shown by what you hang your attention on? What gets your attention? What gets you excited? What do you give your attention to? What captivates your mind throughout the week? One of the ways I thought about this is that it's like anticipation. When it, when it says that they are hanging on his words, you can imagine them there in that temple, like on the edge of their seats. And, and they are just sitting on the edge of their seats, wanting to hear the next word from this king who weeps over them. So I wonder what you're anticipating in your life. Are you on the edge of your seat, anticipating the next vacation or holiday? Are you on the edge of your seat, anticipating the next intimate experience? Are you anticipating the, the next click of the button on that website? Are you anticipating the next drink? Are you anticipating the next salary? Look, most of these things are not bad in and of themselves. In fact, they're good things, great things. But does your heart, is your heart shown by how you hang on certain things in your life? 
you give your attention to them and you have an anticipation for them that is not matched anywhere at all, anyhow at all, by how you hang on the words of Jesus Christ. You see, for some people, this Jesus is just an example to them. He's just a model for their life. See, the problem is, is if you just reduce Jesus to being a good example for you, then you're the one who gets to pick and choose what it is that's an example for you, what, what it is that he models for you. For other people, they're just content with Jesus being their Savior because that actually works out pretty well for us. Maybe we understand us to, ourselves to be liable to judgment and accountable before God, and we say, okay, I love that Jesus is my Savior. But maybe you just leave it as that. You leave it at that and you don't recognize him as the Lord, the king of your life who gets to rule over you, that he has a good authority over your life. You see, if you've only made Jesus your savior, if you've only thought of him as that, is that, okay, great, I've got my ticket to heaven, I'm good to go for eternity, but it doesn't impact your Monday to Saturday or the rest of your Sunday, then there's a deep problem. See, because there's this point where Jesus says to people and he tells the story of those who would come before him one day to come before the king and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these amazing things in your name? See, they even get the title right. They call him Lord, Lord. And they say, we do all these amazing things. But he says, the king will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, I never knew you. What a tragedy. You see, I wonder if the reality of saying that he never knew me is because I never hung on his words. I never knew him because I I had no desire. Me having no desire to hang on his words, to give him any attention, to have any anticipation for what he would want to say to me reveals that I never knew him. That is a tragedy. But it could be also that for some, they're just content with the kingdom. They want the kingdom without the king, as Pastor Isabella said in our last Luke series. So some who would say, look, I, I, I understand that you're the king, but what I'm really interested in is the kingdom because I want to see human beings flourish. I want to see justice and righteousness and shalom. And the king would say, hey, that is great. Yes, you need to seek after my kingdom and do your part to see that come about on this earth as much as possible. For the kingdom to come to Nairobi and wherever else, just as it is in heaven. We want to see the kingdoms of this world look more like the kingdom of God. That's true. But see, my concern is that for many people, Yeah, they want the kingdom, but the king wants to do business with them. The king says, look, I've got some things that I want to address in your heart. Things where you don't want yourself to be ruled by me. Well, see, we see this rejection of his authority at times by how we reject the community that he wants to give us. Because you may say, look, yeah, I, I accept this king. I accept his authority. I accept his rule over my life. But you say, no, I just want it to be between Jesus and me. Look, if that's the case, I don't know what you mean when you say you're a Christian. You might very well be. You might be born again. But I don't know what you mean when you say you're his follower, when you say it's just me and him. Because the Bible has no category whatsoever for a purely individual follower a purely individual disciple who is isolated from others. You see, immediately when we accept him as Savior and Lord, he calls us into this community, this church family, a body of which we are a part, of which we are knitted together with all of its messiness. He calls us to it. So for you, part of just a practical application to this text, this sermon, is to say, okay, I'm going to open up my life to other people. I'm going to I'm going to say, look, get into my life and ask me how I'm doing. You see for me there are a number of ways where I try to do this where I know even as a pastor 
LVC, I have to do this. So every Friday morning, I meet with some guys who have full permission to get in my face, as it were, and say, Jeremy, how are you doing? How are you doing with this or that? And where I can come into the safe space where there is grace and truth and say, I need people to help me live under his rule. Because you may be wondering, okay, hanging on his words, what does that look like practically? Well, this is where you may need to get with one or two people on a regular basis and say, can you help me walk that out? Can you help me learn how to do that? Maybe like with Jumane or other people, Bible study tools, ways to get in the word and learn how to pray. So look, today is the day. Jesus came into this city and he said, if if only they knew the day and what would bring them peace. So 2,000 years later, Today is the day for you and me. Maybe if you've never surrendered to this king and understood his his rescue of your life to bring you to a God from whom you've been alienated because just like me, I had been a rebel. Saying, no, I want to be the king. And he makes this way for you and me to come back to him and find home, to find wholeness. So if you're watching and you want to know more about this, just reach out to us in the church. We would love to talk with you about that. Or for others who say, yeah, I I am a believer in him. I want to surrender to him more and more. Can you help me do that? Again, reach out to us. Join a home group if you're not in one. Talk to your home group to say, I need this. Because today is the day. Jesus, this weeping king, comes in and he would be shouting to you right now, with a megaphone saying, I have the way of peace for you. I want peace for your life. And so the question is, do you and I have ears to hear that megaphone? Do we have a heart that's willing to accept his rule? And do we have the will and the humility to then put it into practice as we hear from him, as we hang on his words? So will we do that? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you love us enough to speak harsh words at times and hard words, things that we may not want to hear. Because Lord, even though we have been made in your image, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, as male and female, we've been made in your image. But so many of us, in fact, all of us by nature, we want to make you in our nature. We want you to answer to us, and we want to be king. But thank you that you love us enough to come and speak the truth, to show us who God is, and then to give your life on an actual Roman cross 2,000 years ago. So Lord, I pray that these claims, these truth claims that you make, not just in history, but for my life and the life of everyone watching, Lord, I pray that they would sink deep into our hearts and you would bring transformation by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And LVC, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.